It's my trying to get in the act of helping in the Middle East problem. This is not in the book. But it starts out this way. I'll read the first sentence. The other day I told my ever-loving spouse that when I get to be an old man, I may be seen walking the streets with a sandwich board. On one side it will read, warning, global earth may self-destruct. On the other side it will read, have preventive plans, will travel. <laughs> and then I go into what I was up to, trying to get them to take a look at another way of looking at world problems. And I'd like to be with Arafat and Netanyahu right now, trying to give them another way of translating the world. They're really stuck, aren't they? Yeah. And the things that are making it the most difficult, as you'll note and are aware, are the fundamentalists. The fundamentalists, the traditionalists, are those who believe that their prophet has the only real truth. And the fundamentalists are in all the major religions, and they have the power, and they have the veto power, the decision-making power over the earth. And it's very difficult to oppose them. Because they know they've got God on their side. This is why we came to this country to separate religion and the church, uh, government and the church. And it's because once you get God in the act, who's going to argue with that? If you believe that what's in the sacred book comes from a deity, and that's your reality. And your meaningful life depends upon maintaining that reality, that belief. And it seems nobody <coughs> has gotten to what I've been calling the meta level to be able to talk about that without leading to an invalidation. And that's going to cause violence or insanity. So that's the pitch of semantics is that we can transcend this stalemate. But who's interested? I got a call from Beasley today. And Beasley said, he said, I think you have a profound message to deliver and nobody's listening. He said, I think somebody will have to assassinate you to get the attention of the world to you. He didn't volunteer to assassinate me, but he said, that's one way to get the message out. I'll do a lot for you, but I won't do that either. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, last week we talked a little bit about humor. And I thought I'd give you, since we're in a church setting, I thought I'd give you a couple of stories that Bill Cruz tells around. Maybe you've heard these old stories, but I thought I'd give him a touch of humor to start us off. Bill Cruz is the <clears throat> head of, president of the Theological Seminary, the Baptist Theological Seminary in Marin County. And he is a liberal. But he is the head of an organization that is traditional. He goes around all over wherever he gets a chance and tells funny stories. So I accused him one day, I said, I think you keep humor going all the time so nobody will find what your religious biases are. And he says, you're right. Well, one of the stories is of the place where the minister had been giving his sermon 
And as he, after it was over, he was waiting at the door and shaking hands with people, and out came this tall Texan. And the Texan turned to the minister and said, Reverend, that was a damn fine sermon. And the Reverend backed up and said, well now, sir, we, we just don't uh, care for that kind of language. And, well, it was a damn fine sermon. He said, well, I it. And then he said, that was such a damn fine sermon that I put a hundred dollar bill in the plate. <laughs> and the minister said, the hell you say? <laughs> the hell you say? <laughs> and the other one was where the minister had a visiting reverend doing the sermon. And after the sermon was over, the two men were, were greeting people as they left the church. One little old lady came up and she said, Reverend, that was a terrible sermon. And this visiting sermon, uh, Reverend was a little shaken up by that. Pretty soon, as the line came out, here's this lady again. She said, Reverend, that was a very poor sermon. And he was startled a second time, and then a third time through, she said the same thing again. And the home man said, sermon, the reverend there said, don't pay any attention to her. She just says what she hears other people say. <laughs> <laughs> One of my Pemberton papers, and you have, you all have a copy of you all have a copy of this, this one? Yeah, but I didn't bring it. I showed my nephew and I didn't pick it up. You that I'm last time? Do we need it tonight? Because it has in it our third lecture presentation today is a brief on the Pemberton papers of which you now have one. And I think the last one I'll start with first. And that is Paradigms Lost. A new idea for the millennium. I produced this in 1997 for the Organization Development Institute at their annual convention. And what I decided over that was we have paradigms or models of the cosmos. And it, uh, we talked about it at our first session about the Ptolemaic paradigm that had the world the center of the cosmos and heavens above and hells below and all these things are epicycles around and that lasted from the second century to about Copernicus's time and I mentioned that Copernicus when he wrote his paper he wrote it under an assumed name and when you find somebody writing under an assumed name, it means they're going to kill him if they read it and know who it is. I was reading today about, I got from some, from my friend Reg Revens from England, two articles about Salman Rushdie and some other lady now who is on a list whose mother was getting cancer and went back to Bangladesh. And she's had the same thing. They've got this feta, what do they call it? Feta, F-A-T-A-H, isn't it? Fata. I, I, I thought they said fata. Fata. Well, I don't know. Fata. Which means she's, they've offered a reward of killing her, like they did Salman Rushdie. And she's now having a difficult time 
existing in Bangladesh, but he wanted to, her mother wanted to go back with her terminal cancer, wanted to go home. So she took her from the United States back home. And now they've got a reward on for her. And then this is how it is with somebody who comes up with an idea that is shockingly different from what the beliefs are at a given time. And so far, I haven't seen any evidence for somebody saying, well, let's talk about that. Let's, let's talk about that. Because unless you have the skill of being able to talk about something that's shockingly different from some, what, than what somebody else believes, we're stuck in this stalemate. And it's this way, as I see it, all over the planet. And we can get out of it if, if you know another way of making a translation. And that's what semantics for me is about, trying to make a new translation so that you can transcend, you have to get beyond your belief. The one I got from Reg Revens, professor today in England, he was showing how Einstein had said, there's no such thing as knowing the whole truth, Einstein said. We don't know enough to be able to say we know the whole truth. It's impossible. So he said we can have half-truths and partial truths. Nobody knows the whole truth because they don't have the information to make such a statement. That's Einstein a long time ago. And that is sort of like what we're into. And explain, explain that somewhat in the paper I just distributed to you. In the Holy Lands and Sacred Systems. The first, so what I did with my new idea for the millennium, a new paradigm. And it's simply to say, as Luke said, Luke said, behold, the kingdom of God is within. It's in the main room of this church. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now that paradigm never did take. Most people have God as someplace out there someplace making these pronunciamentos through prophets. But if you change your paradigm and say the kingdom of God is within, the whole thing changes. But that would be shockingly too much. It would break every cult that exists. And what's a cult but somebody who has just made a statement based upon God that has built in it the doctrine of exclusivity. Only our prophet has got the real scoop. And that's what, if we're going to survive on the planet, we're going to have to get to that somehow. That's why I did my paper called About Tology. I have a few copies of that paper, too. Now let's go back to the first one. The first one on that list, sorry, Michael, you better write. The Dynamics and Prevention of Human Insult. An insult, if you are a human being, you unavoidably cannot you can't avoid insulting somebody. I had two nice insults this morning driving around Mill Valley. In the first one, there are cars coming together to make a left turn, and there are two lines of them, and I was quite a way ahead and pretty close to the, some car in front of me, and some lady swung around right in front of me and cut me off to go ahead to make the left turn. And I just dropped back and let her go. But it was an insult to me that she wasn't taking her turn. There was plenty of space behind. <laughs> that insulted me a little. 
I got into looking at my mailbox, and I was just about to go into a place to park when a lady quickly backed out of a parking place, and I was caught between screeching my brakes to stop or giving a little push to, and swinging around her, which I did. I gave, gave it the gas, and went around, went into my parking place, and apparently for me to have speeded up, and she didn't know the situation that was going on in me at all. But when I drove in, she came around in her car and she said, you know you can't drive like that in this place. <laughs> Mill Valley, that is. Mill Valley. And she said it with such <laughs> anger and rancor that I thought, oh, well, she, I guess she kicked off over that. And then she said it again with the same loud voice as she came by. And by the second time I got insulted by that, because she didn't know the situation at all, except that I, what she saw was that I'd speed it up to get around her driving too fast. Road rage, they call it. Yeah. And so I said, watch your lip, lady. <laughs> I bet she was startled. No, I, that, that wasn't a very friendly thing to do. But that, after doing whack, whack twice, without her understanding the situation, except her own perception of it, her own translation, and then coming out with her anger. So <clears throat> on our first session here, we talked about how to deal with insult. Well, I've devised what I call a law of insult. And the law of insult is, if I find myself in an insulting situation as a sender of the insult or the receiver of the insult, I'm part of the problem. I'm part of the problem. Frequently it's quite innocently, but I'm part of the problem. If you accept that law that you're part of the problem as a sender or receiver, then you take the responsibility if you know the skill of doing something about it. I would love to have talked to that lady about what just happened, but she was long gone, and I gave her my lip too, as a send-off. But I'd love to have been able to talk to her about that. Anyway, I didn't get a chance to clean up the mess. And uh, you don't win them all. So that's what we did on the Dynamics and Prevention of Human Insult. We did this on our first session. Dynamics and Prevention, and you all had a copy of, of the insult scale. And I try to emphasize that insulting and being insulted are unavoidable. And sometimes you get a chance if you learn some skills to keep it from getting worse. It's possible, but I can't guarantee success. I don't have success all the time, but I, I, I work at it. And this kind of insult, it's the hidden assumption. It's the hidden belief we have that makes most of our mischief. Now, how many know the nine dot problem? One, two, three, four. Well, now, there's a game we, we play here to illustrate the unaware assumption or belief. What I want you to do is put nine dots on a piece of paper. If you need a piece of paper, I'll supply one here for you. I'd like you to try to take a shot of this. Is, is there anyone who does not have a 
a writing instrument, and a piece of paper bow. That's me. You you have no nothing. Nothing. Here. There you go. Yeah, that'll do it. Okay. So when you write the nine dots and with a writing instrument, I give this instructions. For those who know about it, for those who do not know about this. Now the name of the task is to connect all nine dots in four straight lines. Four. Four straight lines without lifting your instrument. <coughs> connect all nine dots in four straight lines without lifting your instrument. And it can be done. You got it. and four straight lines without lifting the instrument. And it can be done. In fact, I know... Is it 12? It's several. I wasn't sure. I think I know 12 different ways of doing that. That should make you feel better. I know one. You haven't, you haven't found one yet. Some people haven't found one yet. Now this is a demonstration in what we call an unaware assumption. You'll find that word in your glossary in the book. The unaware assumption is something that is a belief that's hidden to you. I think I know the assumption, but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> the unaware assumption here is making mischief for several of you. Has anybody had success who's not done it before? Has anyone had success yet? This is kind of sneaky, but it's best one of the best illustrations I can think of of what I call the influence of an unaware assumption or hidden belief. I use these terms interchangeably. Unaware assumption or hidden belief. And we all are loaded with them. We're loaded with them. Things we believe to be reality. We're all identified to a degree with our reality, with what we believe to be reality. Anybody ready to have me show you one way? You ready? You, you know it. You're ready for me to show you one? Anybody that is not ready for me to show you one way to do this? No, only, four four lines lines show me huh? only four lines. Huh? Four lines. Now watch. One, two, three, four. Now what did I do that you didn't do? Went outside the dots. Who said there was an outside? You see, you assumed you had to stay inside. Yes. That's the unaware assumption. 
that's the belief that you approached it, but totally unaware of it. And so you can't do it. It's impossible. And this is what we're trying to do in semantics to say, let's get outside the nine dots to solve something. Get to the meta level and we can talk about something we couldn't even talk about before. People are forever talking about getting out of the box, and they don't realize that this is the box. Yeah, got to get outside the box. That's why I'd like to talk to Netanyahu and, and what's going on in the, in the world right now. As you'll see in this paper I wrote in 86, and been pushing that idea, just to try to get beyond the usual way of dealing with stalemates. But you have to get outside your usual thinking. You have to become first step to get aware that there are unaware assumptions that are influencing us quite unwittingly. Yes, Elmer? What would be your approach to Netanyahu in the airplane? I would like to have the two of them have a short course in semantics, which means meta level strategies. Meta level strategies. And I call my one of my papers meta level strategies for global survival. I did that for international organization. I think about ninety. It may be on the list. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any any comments, questions about what I just did? Are you going to show a couple of the other ways to, have, to do yeah. it? Yeah. Well, you can go. You can go uh, this way, that way, or you can go backwards. With the same same basic back. design. Yeah, you you can go. Okay. I think sixteen ways. If you want. <laughs> But the same principle, you've got to get outside. And that's what people get boxed in with their thinking, <coughs> their evaluative habits, their customary ways of doing things. Now, on the globe, as I sent to Reg Revens in England t today, there is such accelerating change over the earth. And under accelerating changes, we tend to go back to more primitive ways of dealing with crises. And so the, the big movement in the United States now is the fundamentalism, the so-called radical right, going back to the Bible, putting the Bible in the government, putting God in the government, putting praying in the classroom, etc. And this is all this world movement to regress back to the ways that gave you security. And there's a lot of threat. And then the world of science is in clash with a lot of it. You, well, you know, the, <clears throat> when you talk to fundamentalists, they firmly believe that liberal individualism or secular humanism is regression. Yes. They're absolutely convinced right. that liberal individualism yeah. is a primitive way of relating to the world. That's right. Because so, that leaves out God. Yeah. So and and we and you you just termed their their way their way of belief as yeah. being primitive. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a judgment, isn't it? That you're making a judgment against them. Can you live with the uncertainty principle, or do you have to have certainty? I'm trying to to reach the yeah. meta, meta level yeah. you're talking about, okay. and looking at looking at it above the um, the dialogue. Both sides yeah. see the other side as That's being right. primitive. Well, it's the difference between so period and so comma. Since we have so much more we don't know about, we live by the uncertainty principle in science. But we recognize that. 
this, this was one of our epistemological things we did. The absolutist, the relativist, and the transactionist. And this says we measure and talk about it, but when we get to the meta level, we can talk about these people, this person, this person, and this person that says also, I can give you what, I'm open to talking about yours. In fact, if you understand that most people on the planet, when we do a nose count, are living in closed systems. Now, we can't say people who are in closed systems, we got to eliminate them. In fact, if we can handle them in some way that does not alienate them, that gets an understanding of their system, they'll be more acceptable maybe to looking at our system. They we will we'll exchange information. Because then we're going to exchange information. When you get, so you can say, it's open, it's open. Let's, let's talk about it. We in invite people to, let's, let's, let's review it, let's talk about it. And that's the best I can do. I can't, I can't force them to talk. But they are the mischief makers because they make it impossible to exchange information. Closed system thinking. And the world is changing. Since everything is changing, we ought to have some kind of conversational linguistic system that's open to exchanging information. So it's kind of like an invitation. They say, you're the ones regressing. Can we talk about that? It's an invitation for us. Let's see if we can exchange information about that. We can't do much more than that. We can't say, you've got to listen to me. We're saying, it's an invitation to dance. It's an invitation to open things up. It's an invitation to get more information exchanged. Bill, this uh, was uh, illustrated pretty well in the front page of the Wall Street Journal today when they wrote an article about the problems that the European Union is running into with the uh, uh, amalgamation of all different beliefs from all these different uh, societies. Different cultures. Together. <coughs> different cultures. I'm having you sent over there shortly. You. I'm going to get you sent over there. Okay. Straight <laughs> enough. Okay. I accept the... They've got beliefs in all of these societies that yeah. uh, uh, they think will merge but may uh, contradict. I used to say there are only provincial brains on the planet. Only provincial brains. Now, a provincial brain is some brain that has taken in the local stuff. That's all we have. Some are simply less provincial. But the provincial brain is generally a closed system. They, they're so identified, whether it's the language, or the dress, or the pigmentation, or the belief system, the religion. We're nearly all stuck in some belief. And I am stuck on my beliefs. I was born uh, a birthright Quaker, but I have modified my stuff. In fact, I've been writing to the Quaker people and saying, you're pushing Jesus pretty hard. There are a lot of things going on in the world. I think you're, you're getting too hooked on pushing Jesus, evangelizing. And this is what I've liked about this church over the years, is that they are pretty open. Pretty open. In fact, the Quakers had a bunch of people for a while who were atheist Quakers. I haven't heard, I haven't 
seen any evidence of them lately. We have pagan Unitarians right here. Mm -hmm. Pagan Unitarians. Pagan Unitarians. Yes, they're thriving in this church. Well, if you stop and see, just like when I wrote my Pledge of Allegiance, my Global Pledge, you notice I left out God because there are hundreds of millions of people that don't believe in God. There are hundreds of millions of people on the planet that believe in multiple gods. And they're, they're monotheists, polytheists, right. atheists, agnostics. <clears throat> uh, the, I quoted in chapter five of your book, <coughs> The, what's his name? Chapter 5, you remember? Uh, five. Anyway, the paper, paper that I got, oh. and yes, no, maybe. and maybe coexist on the planet. Yes, there is a God. No, there is no God. I don't care one way or another. And then he spells out the mischief in the unaware assumption and how you get stuck on an unaware assumption and saying how it's very difficult. Uh, can't think of name again. A friend of mine, Victor Victoro. Victor Victorov. Victor Victorov. Victor Victorov. He's in Cleveland, Ohio. And he's the one that came up with this paper in, I think, about 1959, isn't it? And he spelled out pretty carefully how, in the times of the witch hunts, how they had it made impossible for somebody accused of being a witch. There was no way of getting around it. And if you, and it was you, no, who was it? Somebody who was here last week. I gave the bottom of page 14, if you want to glance at it. The bottom of page 14, bottom of page 14 is about the report about the Muslim lady who had lost her son in the defense of Islam. And she says she was delighted that he had died in the defense of Islam, and if she had another son, she'd send him to, to be sacrificed <coughs> as well. Now that kind of thinking is based upon this exclusivity doctrine. And this is what the mischief is all over the world right now. I mean, it's a, nobody, I haven't seen anybody in diplomacy doing other than saying, let's tolerate one another. Let's teach tolerance. I've got something through the mail with some stickers on it that says, teach tolerance. Yeah. But we used to have a definition of tolerance. It's putting up with a bastard until he learns more. <laughs> <laughs> and understanding is a different word. Understanding is that I need information to find out what your evaluative system is, how you handle what's going on inside and outside the skin, and then try to relate it to somebody else, and how you can make yourself more comfortable with somebody who's shockingly different from yourself. And you find that if you can get your understanding of how the human brain establishes, maintains, and distorts reality, and you know that process, you can understand that process, then you discover a way of doing something than the usual, which is to tolerate, put up with people. See, what we're trying to say in semantics is this magnificent brain makes value designations 
this is more important than that, this is better than that, this is more valuable than that, this is more fair than that. Uh, your example, your system is, is regression. And so we say, your system is regression. Now, if you can't talk about that, you're just stuck. If you have, I've never seen any evidence of it in the Middle East of any group where a Muslim and a Christian are talking together about anything that's relevant. Because anything I say, if I'm a fundamentalist, if I'm stuck in this evaluative habit, there's nothing can take place except to invalidate one another. I'm wondering where we ever got the idea that we had to be absolutely certain. Can't we live with uncertainty? That's the way I live now. I'm 87 now, and I say I can't know it all. So I can live with uncertainty. I don't have to prove you're right and I'm wrong and the other way, you know, because you know I'm right. You, we don't know. <laughs> we just don't know. Nobody can prove it, you see. I don't care who they are. But I want to, if I must have a stage two evaluative habit, I want to be sure that when I say something is so and I've got God on my side, I don't want you to question it. <laughs> I don't want I you to talk about you. it. I just know I'm, I have my my own acceptance of the uncertainties and I'm not going to question you at all. But you don't look happy to me and I'm happy. And so I'd rather stay my way. How about that? One question that uh, yeah. somebody taught me is that when somebody comes in with this is so and that seems to take the wind out of their sails is can you tell me how you got that idea? Where did you get the evidence and can I can I go and look at my You're telling me I'm wrong. If I say can you can you I You're, want to know what, what you just said is telling me I'm wrong and I don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> See well I, I Sometimes if you say, it's can you show Bible. me the book where you read it? It's in the Bible. Can I go look for it so I can believe like you do? Well, let's get to what you believe. All right. And then I'll tell you whether you're on the right track or uh, not. Well, when you tell me something... Or tell you what I want to say afterward. Yeah, if your religion is right, I want to know how did you come to that conclusion? Because so I can come to that conclusion. In and the beginning was... In the, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. And the word was God. Who wrote that down? God. How did you How did you find that out? It's written in the Bible. No. We're going in circles. <laughs> I mean, this is is this standard? Mm -hmm. Standard. Because you're you're challenging what's the most sacred thing in my life, and that's to believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and so I believe it, every bit of it. Then you have to say, like at Porky and Bess, it ain't necessarily so. And that's an attack on me. But you're saying it's kind of hopeless. In other words, what would, what would she have to say to get you to at least communicate? I mean, try to answer and try to keep it going. Yeah. It seems as though but, it okay. breaks off right in the beginning because... Let's, let's do our little five, six. Five, six. Four, five, six. Yeah. Talk about me and try to understand you. So I go back and forth. So when she says something, it doesn't fit me. What did you say? I said, I want you to tell me how you came to the conclusions you did. And what did you read? What did you see that made you so sure? Well, if I'm saying, when you say that, it makes me feel a little uncomfortable. But if I understand what you're saying is that you're not comfortable unless I explain 
what my position is. I'm just curious. I want you to know okay. I'm so so interested in your belief that I'm curious. Well, now I like that to see. You said I'm curious about your belief. In, yes. Uh, and I'm curious. Uh -huh. And I would say, well, I like that. You do like but I'm not sure I can respond to it. But I've just sort of accepted what I believe. Can you remember when you started believing it so we could go back to the first thing time you heard no. it? Or then you I read guess it? I've, I've always believed it this way. When you were a tiny just little boy, when you were a tiny. I don't know. Those messages, I guess, came in pretty early, and uh, I've never thought thought about them. And I guess it, it concerns you a little. Did your mommy, your, your mommy told you probably? Your daddy. Some somebody gave me this information, and I have no reason for me to doubt it because it it makes my life meaningful to believe it the way I believe. So, it. so you really don't know how you got that belief. No, no, uh -huh. I really can't. So, say. so that makes it hard for me to believe what I want to believe what you believe, but that makes it hard because you can't tell me where you got it. Can you tell me where you got yours? I don't have any beliefs. See, I'm trying to deal with you. I'm trying to find out how you got your belief. You're trying to influence me to have a view. Oh no, I want you to lead me through the path of righteousness. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> True righteousness. True righteousness. You know that the chief source of human anger is from the frustration of the need to influence. That's most human anger. Now you said a mouthful. If I try to influence you and you're yeah. not getting the word, I'm getting more and more disturbed. And if I say it doesn't matter to me, that just infuriates you more, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Well, like you're making a joke out of it. You're doing a three on the scale. Aha. Uh -huh. No big thing. And that's an invalidation, too. If we can continue, that you, yeah. you said, you had admitted that uh, you were taught that, and that's where you stood. But then how do you, how do you speculate, number five or six, how do you speculate where she is so she so it kind of revert, keeps well, the thing going I ask this question. without her cutting off? First, I want to say, what do I want to do? I want to ask you first, would you like to talk some more about it? Uh, oh, yes, definitely. Okay. You can tell me how you got your belief, what led you, and you can lead me through that same thing. So I'll get, tell you what I want. Maybe I don't want to talk about it because it's too threatening to me. I see. And I find myself or don't be wanting, not, wanting not to say other than, well, I don't know where I got what I believe, but I, I need it because it makes me feel secure. See, now, if, if like a minister, a revival minister, and he wants the flock to believe him, they need to know a few things. They need to know what his authority is, where he got his ideas. That's all they need to know, this group. They're a different group. They, they don't, aren't attracted to charisma. You know, they need to, to have a... You talking about yourself now? No, no, I'm talking about... I was thinking one time, uh, I went to substitute to school, and it was George Washington's birthday, and the children were running in the ground and said, there was this boy in another class who said, George Washington was a red-hot mama. And so I said, well, let's go and ask. Before you get so excited, they were so angry, and they wanted me to say that boy was bad or whatever. And I said, well, when we have a break, find him and ask him where he found that out. And then he, they went all went to him. They said, he said, uh, he got it from his teacher. And so then they were really, I said, pretend you're detectives. So then they went to the teacher, and she said that this was a song. And she was singing it. <laughs> and, and it uh, uh, George Washington was a red hot mama? Yeah, that was the song that, that, okay. that they were singing in the you know, nightclubs or whatever. And, <laughs> and, and she was singing it when she exercised. And so she was out there jumping rope and singing Was George Washington's a red hot mama. And it got these children so, and so they were all laughing, you know, because she assured them that it was a song and that it was good to skip rope and sing. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm I'm persistent on this little right. I, I you, think so too. as I understood, you never said where you were. You no, I, I'm nowhere. I'm nowhere. I'm a I'm a, a blank slate. Okay, but so you in stopped. order for me to learn, I want him to take me. No, but you didn't share your whatever beliefs you had. You didn't share them with him. No, you just kept asking questions. I just asked him. I want to know. Can you go back to who told it to you? Let's go on a mystery search and find out the first time someone said it to you. Because I need that. I need to go the, through the path that he went through. See, I know, I know pretty privately he can't do it. But I mean, he's, I know he's going to end up with something that it just came down from heaven or somebody told him it was so and he could Okay, and then you say where you are. No, but, but I don't have to. You see, I don't have to. I, I'm waiting for him to, to teach me that we can go out and see something tangible or, or show me something right. tangible. But that's where Fred said, you're putting it all on him. And but you're but not, he's, you're not saying he's, you he's bringing me his belief. And I'm saying, I have no problem with your belief. I need, for myself, I need to go through the steps that you went through. And, and like he's going to fall down in it because yeah. Notice, so, so notice what she says. You have a, you have a motive. Then she's too. talking about me. Well, she says, about me, she says. Uh -huh. I need to find yeah. out yeah. more. Yeah. Right. I need I'm getting, to. I want more information where this came from. Uh -huh. And I, I mean, need to also I like, I like tangible. What, I like what you did. I don't know how you could have done it in a more understanding way myself. Right. Well, to disarm you. My, my main purpose is to communicate with him. I, that's my only. thing. I don't care what he believes. Well, I'm curious. When he gets to the point where he says, God said it and I believe it, now what do you do? Well, then I'm going to say, can you tell me where God, how can <laughs> I have God say that to me? How can I? Because I have not really had any messages lately from him on my okay. phone or anything, you know? Well, there's the old philosopher comedy routine about it. It's in the book. It's in the book. Some people will always say that. They will say, well, it's in the Bible. Well, that's, 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 that's it. Yeah, let's go to the Bible, and I'll tell you some other things that are in the Bible that you might be surprised about. Well, okay. yeah, but it's hard to, it's, yeah, that sort of stops the conversation if they just say, well, it's, here it is, it's in the book. And it's being taken it's literally. In, yeah, or, but I know you can't it's say it's, it's, it's in the company it's manual. Yeah. <laughs> well, how about this? Um, can we talk about what it's like to, to live with a strong belief like you have? and to live without such a belief, like I, would that be a way to get to the metal level? It must be uh, comforting in some ways to have a strong belief, but I wonder sometimes uh, has your belief uh, not been so strong? Has that been scary? If I run into somebody who has a strong belief, I don't, uh, it's like that demonstration I gave of hypnosis. I had a colleague that I shared office space with years and years ago. And he was in internal medicine, and he had terminal carcinoma. And I visited him, I think it was the night before he died. And he, when I walked in to his home in Mill Valley and talked to him, he said, Bill, he said, I just had a a great big bowel movement, and I got the cancer's all gone. The cancer's all gone. What do you think I'd say? Hooray! I just went along with him. Sure. Like, you know, the next day he's dead. But I certainly didn't say bullshit. No. no. Or, oh, you're, you're full of beans still, or whatever. I didn't, you just don't do that. You go with what you get sure. with people. And then pretty soon it becomes, if you ride along, as I was saying about hypnotic dialogue, you're going with, you don't have to agree with them, but you can understand where they're coming from and how it is for them. And you sort of go along and Say, I, I dig what you're up to, how you feel, what you believe, and then pretty soon the, the law of reciprocation sort of takes over. Since I can understand you, there's some kind of human law that says, 
maybe you'd like to understand my viewpoint. Sure. Because you just took up down that fence. That's what yeah. you did. Yeah. You just said yeah. there isn't a barrier between but us. But I don't start off by a two, which is to contradict. And this is what people are doing. Netanyahu and Arafat just contradicting one another. Same thing happened with with uh, Saddam Hussein and Bush. They just oh. kept calling one another names until they had to kill. It was so stupid. I mean, it didn't need to be happened at all. You remember what set off the conflict in the Desert War? There was a, a daughter of a What's the country, country we were, there? We were, Saudi Arabia. Hmm? Saudi Arabia or Kuwait? No, Kuwait. 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 Right. There was a daughter of a diplomat in Kuwait who, pers who talked to the United States Senate and told how the Iraqis came in to their hospitals, killed the babies, and took the, all the baby goods back to Iraq. And that brought about a vote by the Senate to make war. And it was bullshit. It never happened. It never happened. But this is how somebody can think of something atrocious and shock people, and you get these dramatic reactions. And if you were there, you would have said, well, show me the evidence. I'd like to <laughs> walk me through it. I'd like to have <laughs> some I think in World War One there were these stories, and uh, you know there were so many rumors like that in World War One that the Germans were doing this kind of yeah. thing. The Huns. Yes. That was the Hungarians. Oh. They were part of the German group. Anyway. But your, I, I embrace your idea that if you can somehow you can break up, break get, it, yeah, get beyond the stalemate and do you, But you see, if we say I am in the law of insult, I am part of the problem. If I find I'm dealing with somebody and they're closed off, mm -hmm. I may have been part of the closure process. So I take the responsibility of seeing if I can move it. And I like what you do because you're trying to get more information. Let's get back to the source, if that's possible. Because you can say, as you would say, that's what I want. I want to move on this. I'd like something. I'd like us both to come out feeling pretty good about one another. Right. That's what I want. That's usually my bottom line. But the minute you cut out the hostility between you, you disarm the other person then. Yeah. They haven't got anything to fight about now. I'm interested in religions. I'm interested. When I went around the world the first time, I was just interested in all these different ways of uh, being comfortable with them, with, within a system. And I saw strange things happen, as you know, if you go all over the world and look at religious ceremonies. And when I look at ceremonies now, I think ceremony is a behavioral reinforcement from your belief. See, if you can put a ceremony to it, it reinforces what you believe. And then it gets more reinforcement, more reinforcement, and that you get stuck in your reality. Now, I'm pretty comfortable with thinking uh, the stuff that I pour out here. There may be a five that makes a lot of this stuff obsolete. I'm open to that possibility. Don't you think the abortion rights and the anti-abortion groups, that they, they can never can seem to get beyond, uh, I mean, the, the anti-abortion people, they, they can't get beyond anything but that. They never. Yeah, you could never talk to them like, um, are you willing to help support the child that's born? Are you willing to 
assume the responsibility for any health risks for the mother. They never will discuss any farther. But we've got a three-letter word underneath uh -huh. a lot of these things. And if God is taking that position, and God says homosexuality is an abomination, if he said that, I don't know, I don't know my Bible that well, then that's the way it is. I don't, I don't, I haven't read that much of the Bible, but I don't think he ever said anything about abortion. It's, it, it, well, yes, oh, sure. Can't he's save life. It's he, what, murder. God, it's murder. God, where does it, what chapter in the Bible is that? You can't, it, it's one of the commandments, thou shalt not kill. <coughs> That's the first commandment. Is that the first commandment? I, 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 I understand. I'm thinking, I'm thinking of where I said that. Even if the giving birth to the thing kills the mother, then how do you, you got to get beyond that? Then? But I've never heard anybody say, I'll put up some money to take care of the children. You know, and I'll make sure that they, I've never heard it. Uh, anti-abortionists say something like that. I can understand, I think, how they arrive at what they believe. <clears throat> but I would take your position and say, I'm uncomfortable with that position and I'd like to talk about it some more. And for me, I'd like to talk about it. Because yeah. I need it. Now, some people are going to say, go to hell. <laughs> Not, I don't want to talk about it. And we're not going to win them all, are we? I don't think we'll win that one. <laughs> you know, my experience has been that the pro-choice people and the anti-abortion people more often than not just talk past each other. It's exactly like you say, I believe. They're both part of the problem. And yeah. neither side, I've been to many debates, and neither side hears each other at yeah. all. Well, they, 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 there, there's no way to be able to talk about that. Now, that's what I, when we're introducing, when we're introducing what we're doing, we're saying, let's get outside of the box we're in. And I've got a trick, I'll show you how to get out of the box. Might show that. Let's get out of the box. So we can talk about it. Because if we can't do something other than invalidate one another, Somebody's either going crazy or we're going to get, get killed. And I've been reading lately more and more the close-up of the fundamentalists, how they're so stuck in their position. It's just like it, they're willing to kill right now, like the lady that will give her son to protect Muslimism. And there is not only Rushdie, but this, this new lady that now has her, lady, her uh, mother in, in Bangladesh. And the utterances by the people who are wanting to kill her. And this Fata, is it? Fata? I don't know. If somebody issues this thing, I probably, I think I probably told you in the first meeting that when Komeini first put the reward on Rushdi, I wrote him a letter and said, in a four-hour conversation, I challenge you to a four-hour conversational exchange, I believe I can get you to drop the reward. Well, of course, I never heard from him, but I gave the invitation. And I did the same thing with Saddam Hussein. And I was at the embassy in Washington when I got in touch with my message to Saddam Hussein, and the, the embassy there thought I'd hear from him in a few days. Never heard from him. But <laughs> I gave big compliments about Iraq being the cradle of civilization, and how he belonged yeah. to the community of nations, and it's kind of a glorious I, thing I presented, urging him to have a conversation. <clears throat> but then I've been rapping on doors like that all my life. And that's why my friend today, Beasley, said, he'll probably have to kill you before they'll know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, let's see. Here we are at quarter of nine, and is there some unfinished...
for anybody here about what we've covered, attempt to share ideas, anything that's not clear, or you'd like any more word about. Because I have talked about <clears throat> the Holy Lands and Sacred Systems, a semantic perspective, you've got that one, about cults, ethnic cleansing, and evaluative insanity. I call that evaluative insanity, is this ethnic stuff. Now here's this brain, a man by the name of Rosenthal, was the chief philosopher under Hitler for the regime. And he's the one who made the designation that Poles and Jews are a subspecies. Now, under an authoritarian regime, if you've been told that you're going to eliminate a subspecies, no big thing, is it? We did it in America with the Indians. We called them savages. And it's all right. In fact, we used to shoot them in the early days, knock them off, and because they were savages and sort of subspecies. And so the, the brain <coughs> makes a designation. Then a lot of people back it up. And they believe it. And then they start the mystery. This is what the brain does all the time. And ethnicity. I think I told you about my friend Hayakawa one day and I talking about that guy. One of us said, he's a good guy. And the other one said, he is a good guy. And we both started to laugh because it's like, if we agree on it, then that's the way it is. <laughs> and that's what we do right along. When we meet somebody we don't know, What's the first thing you do with them? What's the first thing you do? You look for what you have in common. And what you have in common makes you feel more comfortable with them. Because we're uncomfortable with people who are different from us. And the difference can be God knows what. The brain can make things, make such finickies if it's somebody who has a beard, or somebody who has not enough hair on top, or it can be anything that we're uncomfortable with somebody if we have made some kind of a designation. Mm -hmm. And then we start to behave in terms of our own designations, and the first thing you know, we're alienated from somebody. And then we'll probably go around and find somebody else to agree with us about that person we've now made a value designation. How did you feel about Charlie? Oh, God. Oh, yes, that's the way I feel about Charlie, too. Can I tell you one more joke? Yeah. Yes. Unless you have a question first. There's always room for another joke. <laughs> this yeah. is the one I have in my book about Charlie Wool here in San Francisco. About, about what? Charlie Wu, Chinaman, yeah. Chinese gentleman, ran the restaurant, and there was a redneck, so-called, came in, and each time he'd say what he wanted to eat, and then he'd say, I want fried rice. Charlie, say fried rice. Charlie would say, fried rice. And he'd go, ha, there he goes again. So one day, his son came in, he was in Harvard Law School, and he was visiting for the summer. He said, he said, son, I want you to teach me how to say it right, the way other people say it. So the next time the redneck came in, he said, he wanted the dinner, and said, and I want some fried rice. Charlie, say fried rice. He said, Fried rice, you pick.
Yes, Cameron. So, uh, I meet a uh, Muslim. Yes. Who believes Allah. Yeah. And let's just pretend I believe I'm a Methodist or something. I believe in God, Jesus. Um, we have in common religion. We both have a, a, a belief. Yeah. Now, can we communicate with, on that basis? Would you like to talk about this difference between Allah and God? Or are they the same, or just well, a different I, language? It doesn't make any difference. I would say that I'm, I feel pretty good in my religion, and I, I assume that you like you feel pretty good yeah. in your religion. Yeah. So. Do we uh, need to talk about it anymore? No, maybe. How do you do on the uh, on uh, on baseball? You interested in baseball? Looking for something in common. Yeah. Or yeah. Looking for something in common that'll, you know, make the soft pedal of our differences. Right. So I can see he's a good person. You're a good person, and you have a you, you don't go out and kill or shoot. You go, I'm a good person. I try. Okay. But we, we, we can't get any place you discussing want to talk? Islam and, and Christianity. I would ask a question like, there are more Muslims on the planet than Christians, according to the statistics. It's the most popular belief system on the planet. And I'd like to ask, are Allah and God just different words for something mm -hmm. that we've designated as God and Allah? Or is there something that's in common with those formulations? Or the fact that Muhammad was the prophet and Jesus was another prophet? Mm -hmm. And they tried to help people make their life more meaningful. Do you want to talk some more about that? Well, only the now we're left with the uh, you're left with the the uh, your book, and I'm left with my book. Yeah. And presumably they're they're both by the prophet. So again, uh, if I believe my book, and you believe your book, they, they are different. Yeah, I'm sure. So again, uh, there's no sense going on with this because you're happy in your belief, I'm happy in my belief. So you're more comfortable if we don't see what I've just done now. Yeah. If I see what I've taken a six and translated, you're more comfortable just letting it ride. Yeah, but I don't want to. I I want. I still like you. I, I want to converse and okay. go out to the ball game or something. Sure. You know, have a relationship. I'm. I'm it sounds good to me. Yeah. So we, we don't like have to talk about religion. Okay. It's, you got yours. Yes. I got mine. Okay. If that makes you comfortable, I'm all right about that. Yeah. Or if I say, no, I've got to get you to take another look right. at, uh, at Jesus. And what if one of you were a Jehovah Witness? So then you'd, then you'd have to influence you or, a or separate and never never talk to you. Because they, I think <laughs> they believe they either they have to be around people who believe just like them. And so they're always trying to convince somebody else. So it would be hard to keep a friendship going. Yeah. I was, there was a column in Chronicle a couple of days ago where the lady was saying a Mormon came up to her door and said, we have some information we'd like to talk to you. And she said, I'm really not interested. And they said, all right. And they walked away. And that was it. But she said, that isn't what some of them do. Some, some of the believers have to push I had a lady as a patient uh, nearly 50 years ago, and she came to me, and she was one of these, what do they call a group? What's the group that is the most tourist system that pushes so hard? So Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witness. Oh, Jehovah's Witness. I think she was a Jehovah's Witness. And she had been out sinning. And it seems that she would go back to her religion for about six months. 
And then she'd go on a tear and have everybody go to bed with her and riled up the family like crazy. And then she'd go back to her religion and get forgiven and start all over again. <laughs> and then about another six months, she's gone again. And she said, I just couldn't exist without being able to go back to my belief system. It just couldn't exist. And this was her, this was her cycle. Whatever she was getting out of her religion left something out, and so she would tear around again. And she was, and the fact that this was so important to her, and I find that many people who are pushing an, what we call an extremist religion means they got, they have some doubts about their system. Oh, yes. And so this is this is how they remove the doubts is getting somebody converted to their belief. So that's why they're so heavy on it. Right, they're so f afraid <coughs> that, it, that your belief, just you're even not talking and being there, not believing, is a threat to them. Yep. Because they, they are fear that it's going to emanate out. <laughs> and so they get angry because they can't influence you. And they have some doubts about their belief system if they can't. That's but, but don't you think well, I always offer to have them come in and I'll tell them about my religion because it makes me very happy. <laughs> and I'd like to tell them why, you know, and then they say we're not allowed to do that. <laughs> but look as if you're going to ask a question. Two girls right? together. They're not allowed to come into my house and let me tell them about my religion. Good. That's an that. Okay. You don't do that. It seems an awful lot of conflict arises where there is ostensibly a uh, not of, uh, where God doesn't so much have to do with it, but it's just maybe a difference in perception. Two people running for the same cab from different sides of the street. I've been waiting longer than you. I didn't see you, you didn't see me. How do you have a meaningful dialogue to, the simple solution might be to ask, where are you going? I'm going to the same neighbor that share the cab. That might be the best conversation, but uh, probably more often than not, maybe it doesn't resolve that way for those critical questions don't get asked. When we look at court records of views of an accident, there never seems to be any total agreement because we approach something from a little different geographical place. And so the, case, the judge then <coughs> has to decide which is the more accurate thing. If we use our structural differential and talk about our abouts, no two people in the planet have the same abouts. And if we start with that premise, no two humans on the planet have the same abouts, which means taking in what's going on. And then when they talk about it, they're going to talk probably consistently with what they perceive. But there are no two perceptions exactly alike. There are no two statements about perceptions exactly alike. And if we start with that kind of premise, then when we disagree, we can say, do we want to try to come as close as we can to a commonality about it, unless we're playing frog games? Otherwise, we just get your viewpoint. We've had a lot of demonstrations of this. We used to pass around a, a scene where there was a confrontation on a subway in New York. And we would have people make their interpretation of what they had seen. And no two people had the same perception. There was a, a black man involved at one point. I mean, he was standing there. And quite a few of the people said the black man was the problem, and he wasn't involved in it at all, but that <laughs> it was how a little complex scene, and then see what kind of interpretations. Or we would start a sentence around with one person and pass it around, and by the time it got through this many people, for instance, what was said to that person is not at all what she said to him. And this is what, if we, we, we accept this, and that's what 
you like, maybe I like it, and that is uncertainty. If we can just live by the uncertainty principle, it gives us a starter instead of the certainty principle. My finding is that people who believe run their lives by the uncertainty princi principle have more predictability and adaptability than people who live by the certainty principle. Because the certainty principle That's people, the certainty principle people set themselves up for an insult. Sure. See, they're going to be invalidated. When they take a position that says it's so period, they've set themselves up for somebody who's going to say it's not so. So we innocently set ourselves up if we live by the certainty principle. Well, they're so rigid that they can't adapt to different, they can't have different dialogues. And we say they're identified with their assessment. And that's the mischief. If you're identified with your assessment totally and can't say, oh, maybe there's a margin of error, or maybe I was projecting and distorting, God knows what. Maybe God doesn't know that either. But once we do that, you're a little, yeah, Fred? That's what we have to work out in this country where we have so many different uh, uh, people, so many different beliefs, and we have to work it out peacefully because we don't have the we don't have the option of war anymore in the United States. Yeah, right, right. <clears throat> and the whole slavery thing, if you look back in our history, yeah. and Doing the now. slaves from Africa were a subspecies. And slavery, we, we've had more times of slavery on this planet than we have of non-slavery. We still have slavery in some places on the planet. And this is based upon somebody's designations, value designations, and then they believe them, or they convert other people to believe with them. But that program that started last night about the, the history of the Negro or the I slavery. Didn't see it. I didn't see it. Uh, but it, the way it happened is that they needed these people to work for them so badly. And there was this free man who was well-to-do and was black and it, they had to have some way of designating that these people could not become <coughs> free. And so they chose the ones who were dark, the ones that were the uh, white people came, and they were virtual slaves, the indentured servants. Yeah. But they could work it out because they could blend in with the population. Yeah. And so this well-to-do man, Johnson, who came and was owned property and was a landowner, he, all of his relatives became slaves because they were black. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful program. I missed it. The editor of Ebony Magazine, you know, I can't think of his name right now. He was the, the man who first startled me with an observation that the whole business about slavery would have ended with the South if the North had wanted to cooperate with the South, the Southern white people, who knew the Negro, loved them, took care of their children, he cared for their old and sick. He cooked the food they ate and they trusted them beyond what they trusted a lot of white people they did know in the community. And therefore, the Southerners stood beside their black people, many of them, but up north we didn't get it, so we were ready to fight over it. Now that was what he said when he was editor of the Ebony magazine. I don't know any more about him, I've except that I thought it was a very interesting, interesting thing to hear. Interesting interpretation. Yes. Because after all, if we look at it semantically, we say all we have are translations, interpretations of what's going on. Yeah. And if we allow ourselves to admit, like Einstein said, we don't know we only have half truths because there's so much more to be known. And that's what we attempted to do here in this little closed group was to reinforce your own viewpoints that are in the direction of openness and humor and comfort, comfortable outcomes. And I hope we've had a chance to exchange enough information to reinforce the open system. 
Oh, this is fun. I'd love to hear people so, talk. It's after nine, and I yeah. appreciate your having me here, and I'm delighted to have. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, yeah.